you, Dr. Rick Wallace, dropping in. Hope everybody's having a great day. Uh, just wanted to stop in real quick and sort of give you a uh, prologue to the video that you're about to watch, which is a two-segment interview that was done with the Recapture broadcast, which actually is hosted uh, by two of my younger sisters who happen to be identical twins. Uh, the one that normally hosts the show didn't make it, so they cover for each cover for each, cover for each other as they always have, and so uh, they showed up. And it was uh, primarily supposed to be about CRT, critical race theory. They asked me to stop in and talk about it. Uh, now, this is a religious broadcast, and so they have their perspective, and it doesn't always align up with where I'm at. But I love my sisters. Um, and I love their hearts and the work they do. Uh, they do a great deal of work in the area of addiction and recovery, and I respect that. And so they wanted me to come in. And so there is, you know, some disruptions in uh, fluidity in the conversation because of the attempts to merge uh, conversations surrounding uh, faith and religion and CRT, uh, which is a critical uh process and i am going to venture into it one more time i've done a couple of videos on it where i've branched out and explained some things and i'm going to do another one uh with dr blanchard on the teachers uh episode not this weekend this weekend we're going to be dealing with a very good friend of mine i call her my little sister uh her name is calvis jones she's an exceptional extraordinary entrepreneur she's also a certified licensed doula and we're going to talk about women's health and we're going to talk about the importance of holistic health for everybody that's going to be on tomorrow so don't miss that tomorrow morning on the teachers on the black voice channel and it starts at 9 a.m central time get ready for it it's going to be off the chain we're going to talk about some hot topics on there as well one of those topics is going to be something we discussed on the interview that you're about to see and that was this uh, horrific tragic story about these children who were left in a home well not a home an apartment for a year by themselves while they were in there with the body of their decaying brother who had died at the beginning of them being abandoned basically uh, his mother's boyfriend beat him to death they covered him with a blanket and left never came back uh, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that we're gonna talk about some other things but we're gonna talk primarily about health but I just want to sort of uh, parlay into and introduce this video so you can kind of get some perspective what I really want you to do in watching this video is I want you to write down your questions uh, that arise from the conversation about critical race theory in specific and I want you to email them to me at CEO at the Odyssey Project 21.top because I want to make sure that we cover all of these questions and give some real uh, clarity to this discussion about critical race theory and why it's being misrepresented, mispresented, and being hyped up to be something it's not. And the thing is, uh, you'll see in the discussion in this interview that critical race theory, as it, as it, as it sits, as the brainchild of people like uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and Professor uh, Derek Bell and, and, and others, is not something that you would even be able to present to kids in school. Uh, it is an elective major majorly postgraduate type uh, elective course uh, that initiated in the uh, legal academy and it has emerged in other fields including education um, and institutions corporate institution and stuff and certain things like that so you'll get an idea in this discussion you know where I sit and what I'm trying to present but ask ask the questions you want to ask write them down email them to me and we're going to address those not this Saturday but next Saturday so again uh, take note understand where this is coming from uh, and try to feel your way through it but I think it was worth doing and anytime my sisters want to be a part of what I'm doing they want me to be a part of what they're doing I'm definitely going to be proud and step in and make that happen so on that note I'm gonna pass it on and you check it out there are two parts 
the first com the per the first segment was done, and actually these segments won't air at the same time, but they wanted me to do them. So the first segment is critical race theory. The second uh, segment is a recap on critical race theory, first couple of minutes, and then talking about the tragedy with those kids. So I'm going to put it all in one sitting so you guys can see it. Um, definitely, I want the questions so that we can really get down to the crux of what we're talking about when we say CRT, critical race theory. On that note, I'm out. You guys have a great day. Hello, sunshine. Good morning, good morning. Hey, you know what? This is Monica Strange. I'm here on behalf of Donica Riscano presenting Recapture. And uh, we have a guest here with us today, uh, Dr. Rick Wallace. Uh, Dr. Wallace is our big brother. And uh, he comes with all these uh, degrees and information and so excited to have him in the studio with me. Uh, today we're going to take a look at uh, critical race theory and uh, we're going to look at this controversial framework and see how it helps us uh, as Christians and how it supports uh, an economic opportunity or educational opportunity. Uh, it's such a controversial conversation though, Dr. Rick. Right, right, right. Yes. So it, persons on the both sides of the argument, they're crying foul. They're crying foul, either side of it. And I'm saying that foul is, they're saying it's false news. It, they're saying it's uh, overstating the past, understanding the now, and lies. Some people just call it straight out lies. They cry, call him foul on each side. So right. we'll let uh, Dr. Wallace talk to us a little bit about uh, critical race theory, what it is, what it's not. Uh, depending on which side you are on the CRT argument, uh, you might be feel, feeling foul. But in our conversation today, we're going to expose uh, the myth of what I'm calling the myth of American Christians today. And, and what's the myth? What is, what is the myth? of American Christians today. Uh, it's the myth of what I'm, it's what I'm calling the myth of the media. Uh, today as Christians, we're allowing our light and our witness or lack thereof hmm. to be spelled out in the media by a select few, whether it's Fox, CNN, MSNBC, we're allowing the media to speak for us as Christians. But we have a responsibility to our faith to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as the lost and dying world to be a light. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men. The Bible says in Matthew 14 through 16, you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl, but instead they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine. Are you letting your light shine? I was talking a little bit earlier to somebody or even to Dr. Rick here. I know people who are using their Christian life and their work to feed the hungry, to share the gospel. Um, when we had Hurricane Harvey out there treading in that water, not for their family, but for other people, but we're having a media that's showing a, a ill-shown light for Christians. It's looking like, oh, they're argumentative. Oh, they're hateful. They don't love anybody. The scripture says in John 8 and 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will walk, will never walk in darkness. Oh. What? If you follow Jesus, you won't walk in darkness. You won't be yelling at people on the internet. You won't be fighting with the people at the school board meeting. But you're going to walk in the light of God. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light of life. Isaiah 16 and 11 says, Arise, shine for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Ephesians 5 and 8 says, For you were once in darkness, but now you're the light in the Lord live as children of the light. That's what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to dispel the myth of the media that the, the Christians are just out there arguing and fighting and hating on the immigrants and don't want to talk about race in school. There's plenty of people that I have great relationship with, 
Caucasian, Latino, Asian, we're standing and sharing the light. And so we want to talk a little bit about this conversation on critical race theory and what it is, what it isn't, this uh, news media argument about it. Uh, a lot of people just can't stand it. I mean, what do they think is happening with the CRT that they just don't want it so much? So let's get with Dr. Wallace. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, Dr. Wallace. He is my oldest brother and uh, he's the founder and CEO of Visionetics Institute. Uh, he uses a wide range of disciplines, including uh, psychocybernetics, neurolinguistic programming, psychology, neuroassociative conditioning, embodied cognitive conditioning, and transformational vocabulary to help people raise the level of their performance in every area of their life, including finance, marriage, business, parenting, and more. He is also a powerful and electrifying public speaker who speaks to a numerous types and sizes of audience on a number of different subjects. He also focuses on personal life enhancement and as a counselor, uh, Dr. Rick, thank you for joining us. All right, thanks for having me. No worries. Um, and um, I guess I'll begin uh, with sort of clarifying uh, something I think is important uh, to clarify here as far as CRT is concerned, and then we can sort of merge the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk about the difference between religion, relationship, uh, and action, awesome. and how it applies. But first, we have to clarify uh, uh, what CRT is. Uh, okay. The great Neely Fuller Jr. said that until you understand uh, what white supremacy is, how it acts, how it moves, how it impacts you, everything you think you know will only confuse you. And when you, un when you approach racism the way that I have, I approach it from multiple positions because I'm dealing in a multifaceted world. So I don't just approach it from blackness. I'm ap unapologetically black. But those who know me and uh, are friends with me know that I am not in, 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 uh, in, in truth anti-white. And so my, my uh, unapologetic blackness doesn't automatically right. put me in a position to be. But I am, because of my unapologetic blackness, mm -hmm. ready to move in a very deliberate manner towards anyone or anything mm -hmm. that moves against me and my people. Now, the way that this thing works is it's about, di it's about divisiveness. Mm -hmm. The entire system is about divisiveness, and in this system, there has been a pattern of advantageous uh, as, uh, access mm -hmm. for one group, and uh, on a disproportionate level, a lack of access. Okay. And what people think critical race theory is, it isn't. Not so, at all. so the first thing you have to understand about critical race theory is it can't be a lie because it doesn't make a statement. It's a practice. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about critical race theory, it's not a history lesson. Right. It's okay. not talking about what happened in 1935. It's not talking about, it's examining and interrogating practices. Now, first and foremost, CRT is not new. Right. CRT emerged in the 70s and it merged through the legal academy initially. It right. was basically uh, a come out from uh, e, uh, CLS. CLS was critical law. Um, uh, it, was, it was based on uh, examining the legal system right. and laws and determining that law was not objective. Right. That laws could be used to uh, permeate and uh, support a racial caste system. And so, basically, you look at it and it's saying, can laws be codified in a way that one group benefits while another group, group uh, is in placed in a disadvantageous position? And it basically was birthed uh, by Kimberly Crenshaw, who mm -hmm. actually coined it, and Professor Derek Bell, a, law, uh, a Harvard law professor, who probably was the most outspoken and the most recognized voice, but it, there are a number of other people who are a part of it. 
And so basically what you're saying is, can you look into the legal system initially? Now it's moved into the education system. It's moved into a bunch of different areas of uh, society. And what critical race theory is, is a practice of examining laws, mm -hmm. policies, and social constructs that serve to perpetuate a racial caste system. And it's for a number of purposes. Anyone who follows me on any of my channels or have read any of my books, they understand that I'm not about playing the victim card. Sure. I'm not about saying, oh, whoa, it's me. Look what everybody's done me. I'm a black man, blah. I'm about saying, let's see what's happened so we understand it. Everything is about strategy. Everything is about protocols and planning. When you don't have a strategy, when you don't have a plan, you tend to fall victim of the people who do. Right. So let me say this. Uh, looking recently at some research or some other uh, programmers, I was watching the PBS New News Hour. Uh, this was published on June 24th. It describes CRT as a graduate level framework which teaches the legacy of slavery and segregation in America is embedded in the legal system and policies even still today. So the legacy of slavery and segregation in America historically is still embedded in the legal system and policies today. When I look at this in terms of saying it, it's a graduate level framework and it's talking about the legal system, I did know from where you were saying that it's originally a legal framework. Right. I just it, started thinking about the question of, they're not teaching this to school kids. <laughs> they're not teaching this in elementary and secondary education. So where's the argument coming from? It is politics. And what you have to understand is, as I understand it, and as I have studied it, I became aware of it on a an informed level, probably about 15 or 20 years ago, oh, okay. researching, researching one of my books. And I had heard it before, and like, okay, so I said, okay, let me look into it, let me see what's going on. And, it, and what I realized is I had been practicing critical race theory probably for 15 years before that. Okay. Because it's simply critical examination of policies, laws, and social constructs that contribute to a current situation. And what you have to understand, we can go all the way back to, and this is the problem. No, you're exactly, exactly right in your assessment. It's no way in the world that you can actually bring critical race theory, in, even into high schools. Mm -hmm. It's too advanced. It's too advanced. It's too expansive. And it's only offered in you, you, law, law schools uh, as, uh, as electives as an elective. It's not a required subject, it's an elective, but it's a practice. And what happens is in this examination, there are a lot of things that are unearthed though. Okay, mm -hmm. so we can go back. And one of the things that I found interesting in uh, studying it was uh, Professor Bell talked about uh, this thing called interest convergence. And in interest conversion, what he the the, the, the the argument that he was making is that if you look at the legal system, you can go all the way back to the emancipation, like 1865, after the Civil War, when blacks were declared legally free, mm -hmm. except for in uh, the 13th Amendment, where it right. says if you, if you go to prison, then right. all bets are off. Okay, but. Uh, you go back and immediately after that in the South, there were a bunch of policies across the U.S., not just in the South. For instance, in Oregon, uh, there was a, a rule that blacks were not allowed in Oregon. Uh, and if you were caught in the state for more than 30 days, you will be whipped with 30 lashes and then uh, expelled from the state. In other words, uh, the, the great flight from the South uh, except from places like Mississippi and so forth that ended up in the Midwest like Chicago and uh, Indiana and places like that never happened because people from the North, they didn't necessarily, uh, there were a lot of abolitionists in the North mm -hmm. that weren't uh, proponents of slavery, but they didn't necessarily want blacks around them. Oh, okay. Okay, so these laws felt like, well, first of all, you have to understand, when you have an influx of citizens and you have limited jobs, you create a problem, an economic okay. problem. And so that was the first issue, that was an economic problem. Now you have all these people who were contributing to the economy, which was one of the reasons the United States was able to advance so rapidly economically and become a world power. So you mean in slaves or former slaves? I mean, initially it's slaves. Okay. You got free labor in a bunch of industrial uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got a bottom line that's just off the charts right. because the overhead is low. 
okay, you, you got to manage, you got to purchase, you got to uh, keep them alive, keep them healthy. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're not paying a competitive wage right. in any form. Okay, so that that's that part. Now, then you get to the uh, 1865 daily. So the first 12 years are known as uh, Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Most people romanticize Reconstruction as the, the, the 12 years the country took to heal from the Civil War. But actually what it was in the South is those 12 years was the South actually continuing the war in a clandestine guerrilla warfare. So you had clandestine groups like the Klan, mm -hmm. other clandestine groups that would literally ride at night and bomb military installations, set them on fire, shoot up. And it became extremely costly in life and equipment for the Union Army to remain in the South in these installations, which kind of kept order. Mm -hmm. So eventually they picked up and moved back North and left the South to itself. Okay. And with, you know, except extreme situations, they didn't interfere. So you start to see laws pop up that start to move the South back to its antebellum roots, where you had the uh, whites in a superior position, blacks, you know. But let me ask you this. Let's kind of fast forward a little bit to um, some of the things that we know have historically occurred, like modern history. So we know modern context from television, print media, you, let's say if you go back to 1920s, 30s, and then you pop up to the 50s, 60s, where there's modern print media that can support that these things actually happened. Um, so where is this conversation of, I don't want my little kids to hear that. You can watch PBS and see it. You can watch it on YouTube. Uh, it is historical it, context. So well, what you, what you have to understand is when you start talking about media, and you can go back, you can, you know, like with any of the laws, because that's where critical race uh, theory comes from, is examining the laws, where the laws, you know, whether it was uh, convict leasing, whether it was the uh, black codes that didn't allow blacks to own land or take jobs in certain industries, all of those things can be confirmed. Okay, so when you start talking about not wanting kids to hear it and see it, it's not that we don't want necessarily want kids to hear it and see it. What we don't want is for anyone other than us to provide the context. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, we go back, we can look at. Now, is Chris, first of all, is Christopher Columbus the person that we said he was when I was growing up? We actually, for a fact, know now that's not the case. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Oh, yeah, we had to sing all that stuff. <laughs> and now we're starting to find out exactly who Columbus was, and now people are trying to distance themselves. But again, they want to control the narrative and how it's done, so they get to do the spin. See, everything is PR. I, I'm okay with that. So say, for instance, Levi, we was in f fourth grade with uh, my nephew, and he's primarily in Caucasian school. And he says to the teacher, I, I, when are we gonna do black history? Well, uh, uh, I would tell you what happened to me. A period of like a, a presence of shame came on me, actually. I felt like it's not for them to teach you black history, it's for us to teach you black history. That's how I really felt. And so the teacher said, okay, we're gonna do that in February. Oh Lord Jesus, okay. And February came, their black history spotlight was Serena Williams. Oh, Lord have mercy. An athlete, really? You couldn't even do Martin Luther King, who everybody know, and Harriet Tubman? Their whole school program in February was whatever they did that day, and the person in the spotlight was Serena Williams. And that said to me and to my sister, I was like, hey, you are responsible for teaching your child. But, but even something like Black History Month, Understanding the history of how we got Black History Month with Carter G. Woodson initially starting with Black, Black History, history Week. Week. <laughs> and that being because there wasn't any highlighted right. uh, information or history. And when you take away a pe people's history, an awareness of who they are, an awareness of where they're from, uh, an awareness of their heritage. that And people talk, talking about immigrants real quick, then I'll let you ask them that question. Mm -hmm. people, pe one of the things that's used against uh, descendants of slaves uh, is you know, immigrants come over here and they do fine. Even yes. immigrants from Africa yes. come over here and they thrive it's in the system. Local. What's the problem? Well, first and foremost, the immigrants that come over here, let's use Africa because they're black, so they automatically assume right. we're, we're the same, but we don't have the same shared experience. Right. Immigrants from black, uh, Africa come over here with a knowledge of their history. Mm -hmm. They can talk back 
hundreds of years because those stories have been told by griots. And so they have a sense of pride. They have a sense of value, a sense of worth. Everything that we have was given to us, including our name. Uh, the way that we approach our relationship with God was given to us. It's not the natural way that it came. It was the way that it was given to us and why it was initially given to us. And so when you talk about uh, school, you know, uh, we talk, talk about uh, Black History Month, then again, that's a system within a system that we don't control. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at things in, in the school system, because we moved from the legal academy to education, which now critical race theory is also emerged in, and you start to ask the question, okay, how does the system benefit? And so what Derek Bell did, even when talking about that, we talk about Brown, Brown versus, the, uh, versus the Board of Education, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be the end of segregation in the school. And we talk about how that actually turned out and the fact that we are literally uh, 60 years past that and we still have segregated schools predominantly. Well, I did uh, see some research that showed that a lot of uh, people did not segregate the school because the uh, mandate from the Supreme Court for the Brown decision was this segregation was public school, not private school, and a lot of people just sent their kids to Well, that was the first thing that happened was Christians, specifically, mm -hmm. white evangelicals, mm -hmm. uh, their move was, okay, we're taking our kids out of public schools, yeah, we're going to academies move them into, want. basically what they started calling segregation academies, which were private schools, which they didn't have to. Now, eventually, over time and time and time fights again, we got out of that, but again, basically, they still use laws. Uh, for instance, policy uh, that, that supports a social construct. Okay, we know that we have 30% of blacks living at the poverty line. Now, the poverty line is absolutely remarkably low. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, an individual $12,700 a year is the poverty line. For one I don't, person? For one person. I don't know anybody that can live on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's low. 26200 I believe, is for a family of four is the poverty line. 000? So if you actually start saying, okay, let's make the poverty line uh, the median of being at where where the, where the median is a livable income. Right. So now you're talking $40,000. Oh, that's a big difference. Now how many blacks are? Now let's say poverty dictates your ability to get out of poverty. How does that happen? One, one way that it's in policy is in how schools are funded. So your children are going to be prepared to compete in this world by how well they're educated. So how well they're educated. So in other words, you sit up and you, 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 you tax based on income and property value. Well, schools are in wealthy neighborhoods are going to get more funding because wealthy people live in those districts. So again, that's just one way it happens. Mm -hmm. And you can go on and on and on with these different uh, ways that this happens. And you can talk about it all day, but ultimately, critical race theory has absolutely nothing to do with talking about history in the sense of they mm -hmm. did this to us, they did, th it's about saying how do, how in the laws today do we see things that perpetuate it and they are there. Right. Well, thank you guys so much. We have Dr. Rick Wallace with us today and we're talking about what critical race theory is and what it's not. And what we're learning is that critical race theory is not a curriculum that's going to be shared in the classroom no. with your elementary or secondary students. It really is a collegiate level, graduate level framework that talks about uh, the legal system and other policies and systems in America that really are based on the legacy and framework of s slavery and segregation in the history of America. So we just wanted to give you some, a little bit more information about that so that you can continue in your space and uh, debunk the myth of the media. Debunk the myth of the media, which is saying that Christians are hating on immigrants, that Christians don't want information in the classroom, that Christians are not out there uh, in the trenches serving the lost right. and the forgotten. And so uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Monica Strange, and uh, this is Dr. Rick Wallace, and we just wanted to give you one second, which is our tip for the journey. Our tip for the journey is let your light so shine before men that they may see the good works of your Father in heaven. Thank you for joining Hello, us. Hello, sunshine. Hey, it's Monica Strange. I'm here at Recapture on behalf of Donna Cariscano, our great host. 
Uh, she is not in studio today, but we have an awesome guest. Dr. Rick Wallace is here today. Uh, and so Dr. Wallace is our older brother, uh, but he brings with us a great respect. We follow him for his great work that he's doing. He is a psychologist and he's a performance coach. Uh, he helps people with their life and their work and he just does a great thing in the community. And so we thought we'd bring Dr. Wallace back. He was in the studio with us for our previous episode where we talked about critical race theory. What is critical race theory and what it's not? And so with that said, I'll do a little recap on our conversation uh, from last week. What is critical race theory? Well, it's a, a graduate level framework uh, that's used to take a look at um, the legacy of slavery in this country and the impact of the systemic racism um, going beyond racism as an individual, but looking at racism in a systemic way. And what is it not? It is not a curriculum for the elementary or secondary school student. <coughs> Uh, it's not going to be taught in elementary and high school to our students. Uh, it really is a graduate level framework that is going to be taught in colleges and law schools. And Rick shared with us uh, uh, last week that uh, it's a legal, it's not even a, a core class. It's like a, an elective, a, an elective. In, in, in law school. So just want to kind of give you guys a heads up that don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's the narrative of the media, getting us hyped up about what's happening in the classroom with our students, that they're going to teach the CRT, which is a graduate level framework. Most of us don't understand our high school framework, <laughs> so you're not going to get that graduate level framework in the classroom with our students, and so we want to encourage you. One thing I talked about from last week is what I call dispelling the myth of Christianity in America. And what I call it was the myth of the media. The myth of the media. Uh, Fox, CNN, MSNBC has you out there yelling at people, screaming at people, hating the immigrants, not wanting CRT in the classroom, which is not going to be anyway. But I wanted to remind you of what the scripture says, that we're called to be a light and a witness. We're called to be a light and a witness. And here's what First John 1 and 5 said. Uh, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Shut up! God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Don't let the media be your framework. Don't let the media be the framework for Christianity. I know people who make sandwiches for the hungry. I know people who go overseas and minister. I follow a ministry, they're a medical ministry, where they have a medical hospital in Haiti, and this was before all the most recent situations with the, uh, with the I think a hurricane, and then they had some things um, before an earthquake, the assassination of their leader. Before even all of this occurred in Haiti, uh, this Love a Child ministry, as a Christian ministry, has been boots on the ground in Haiti for years as a medical hospital, but you don't see that in the media. So that's what we talked about last week, dispelling the myth of Christianity in America, and we're encouraging you to be a light and a witness and let your light so shine. So thank you for exposing CRT, talking about what it was and what it is not, and just giving us a real good conversation on how we can understand what that platform and framework is about. But today we're gonna to take a completely different uh, conversation. Uh, since CRT really was about uh, our children, elementary and secondary, um, we have a conversation we're gonna have about, uh, for a local news story here in Houston, uh, Dr. Wallace, really sad story here. Right, right. Um, basically, uh, it emerged at the beginning of the week uh, where it, it emerged as a story where a 15 year old uh, called the authorities and said that he and his siblings had been left and they went out to do a, a uh, welfare check and what they found was horrific. Uh, they found three boys, 
if I'm not mistaken. The oldest's name is Jordan, and I can't really tell by the pictures because they blocked the pictures out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the build of the kid, being that they were emaciated and malnutrition, it's sort of hard to tell if it's a boy or a girl, but the 15-year-old's name is Jordan. Uh, there was a 10-year-old <coughs> and a 7-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of funny getting these ages right because that's a year in this story where right. they were one age when it started and they're another age now. Right. So it goes back and forth trying to figure out what, what age they are. Right. But the, the, the gist of it is in the, in the apartment with these children that had been left alone, now we know for an entire year by their parents, uh, well, the mother and her boyfriend. The mother and her boyfriend. Right. Her, the mother and her boyfriend were living in the house with the skeletal remains of their brother, who I think was eight years old when he when he was killed. Right. And the they just put a blanket over him and left him in there. And literally, he decomposed in that house with them living there. And there were neighbors that said they reported the smell and nothing was done. And so the first thing that went through my mind is how many times the kids had to fall through the crack to get to a year before anybody brought them any type of uh, relief. Now, there was one testimony of one one of, I don't know if it was the deceased child's teacher who had either come to the residence or tried to go to the residence because this this whole year, it, like, okay, what happened to him? He just fell right. out Well, the crack. they hadn't been enrolled in school since May of 20. Oh, wow, okay. So... You're talking about, uh, by the time they were found, a year and four or five months that they weren't being tracked by any anyone. So they didn't re-enroll them. After they finished school in May of 2020, they were never re-enrolled in school. So everything that happened after that was, you know, uh, there was a case with uh, CPA, uh, CPS, but it had been closed. And so I asked, with what you could see with these kids, just from what I've read, that should have been something that prompted a deeper, a deeper follow through. Right. Uh, you know. But Let me ask you something, Dr. Rick. I, in one article I read, I think it was something you posted, but I actually read the article, that the mom had more than one autistic child. And I was thinking, wow, is there a reason for that? Why more than one of her well, children was autistic? Now, you're getting off into some very controversial, uh, okay. <laughs> very controversial <laughs> areas when it comes to, especially African American boys and autism. Okay. The numbers have spiked over the last 20 years. Okay. Um, and I, I actually deal with parents of autistic kids and mm. autistic kids, so I seen the whole spectrum from low, low end to high end spectrums like Aspergers, where mm -hmm. kids can be very functional. Uh, nonverbal and on down mm -hmm. and so I've seen it all but there's been a spike and there was a direct connect uh, to a certain type of vaccine MRT vaccine that uh, was actually outed by someone at the CDC who was terminated and then later ended up dead oh wow yeah so and this was in the earlier 2000s yeah, that yeah, they, they, like 90s that, or something. Yeah, yeah that they came out and said we knew that this was going to be an issue and so they they you know did the pr and all that stuff so like I that so i don't want to get into it we don't want we don't like, know i just thought it was so sad i was it, like wow to, to i see, was like thinking is and, and and forgive me for being a lay woman and in a level of ignorance you know, but i was like is this genetic for her kids and that that goes the thing see that i mean you talk about autism you're talking about a, a, a discussion that can go so many ways there are on the high end of autism when you're talking about asperger's Normally, you find uh, a lot of behavior that you would consider uh, non-social, uh, you know, that you would consider to be dysfunctional mm -hmm. and not core, uh, which would qualify them for some form of, form of IEP in mm -hmm. school because they don't function normally. But there's always something that they excel at. Oh, in okay. Asperger's. I mean, when I say excel, I mean right. excel. Like, they, they are better than the average person right, at it. Pianist but, or... And so there are actually scientists that are saying that the high end of autism is a part of evolution and that uh, Asperger's I gonna, I, is, I is, is the genius. No, like, is Asperger's is the next step in brain evolution because one of the problems we have as humans now, if we are admitted, is the more knowledge comes in, the less we focus. Asperger's, kids with Asperger's have no problem focus. That's all they do is focus on that one thing. You can't get them off of it. Okay. 
And if you disrupt their schedule, you get all kind of problems. They're very acclimated to schedules and patterns. So you put them on a schedule right. and they just move it. You, they'll become automated in the schedule. You don't have to do anything with them. They'll get themselves oh, wow. dressed, they'll do it. So that's that part of it. So could it be genetic? I'm gonna say one verse real quick because I just believe that infusing the word in our conversation, it helps our audience and it helps me in terms of, hey, you guys, we're here with the word. Okay. And you know, generally, uh, Donica, she's not here, but when we were teenagers, we would be in these arguments as teenagers, as Christians, all the little kids in the Sunday school class, and what does this say, what does this say? And Donica, as a teenager, she'll say, what does the word say? So Jesus said, uh, Jesus called unto them and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, of such is the kingdom of God. And verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall in no wise enter their end. So Jesus is telling us to call us as little children. And Jesus himself says, suffer the little children to come unto me. For you, those of us who are parents, who are aunts, who are school teachers, don't forget the kids like they were forgotten in this particular situation. Go out and help them, support them. L let your voice know what's going on in the lives of these children. Okay, Dr. Rick, back to you. Right. Well, in, in, in speaking, when I think about uh, kids and I think about the Bible, uh, there are two actual scriptures that actually come to mind to me okay, great. Uh, that I think are fitting. The first is... Dr. Uh, Rick is not just a doctor, he's a theologian. Um, is uh, written by, Paul says that he who does not care for his own, especially those in his household, is worse than an infidel. Yes. And the second set is spoken by Christ, and it says that the least you do unto the least of these, you've done, unto you've me. done also unto me. Yes. And so it talks about how we treat, how we care for. And I had a very long uh, monologue on my channel, on, the, on multiple channels, on this situation. And it's about community, it's about caring. We have entered into a, an era of individualism. Mm -hmm. uh, we can say it as a country, we can say it as a global prospect, we can say it as a race, uh, we can say it even in families. We are seeing where everybody's out for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's about what I wanna do, how I feel, and what I want. And don't, I don't want anyone telling me this. I don't want to be held accountable. I don't care about a village. I don't care about a community. I just want to do me. The problem is we're social creatures. So however you view it, at the very core level of science, when you look at social creatures, social creatures, most mammals are by nature social creatures. Social creatures operate by social code, social construct, and shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's how the group operates. When you take and you you you, you can, I mean, go watch a, 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 a pride of lions. There's a code. There's responsibility. Everyone knows what they do. Anyone operating outside of that code can get punished. Go to um, a family of gorillas. Mm -hmm. There is a code. Well, I saw a, a natural channel, and they had a video of an elephant, and I don't know what the tribes of elephants are called, but they had herd. A, a herd of elephants. Yeah. It was a baby elephant that was abandoned in some way, didn't say how the parent elephants were not present, but this baby elephant uh, had been abandoned in some kind of way. They nursed it back to life, and they put the baby elephant with the herd of other elephants, and they adopted the elephant in. So this herd of elephants adopted in this baby elephant that was not a part of their herd. And so that kind of just spoke to my heart about we can and should be doing the same thing if animals are Man, doing I, it, I've actually, why aren't we doing it? I've actually seen a lioness adopt a gazelle, oh, really? a baby gazelle. Really? And, to, and she, <laughs> she did it multiple them. times. Oh, okay. She would kill the mother and adopt the baby. What? But, but, but because the baby hadn't gotten to an Big age where it could feed and eat the brush, it needed to be fed milk, it would eventually die. She would mourn the baby mm. and go through the process. And, and they watched her for over a year or something, and she would do this. And all kind of tragedies would just happen because that's not the natural art of right. thing, but that was something about it. So there's this level of compassion even in the most instinctive killers. Mm -hmm that we're failing to see in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ask yourself, where's that coming from? Why are we here? 
And with this family, it goes deep. And now the paternal grandmother is saying that they lived with her five years ago. And when she would go to work, the mother would be bringing in different guys to her house and they got into it about it and she asked him to leave. Mm -hmm. And she wished she didn't now. And she's only the paternal grandmother of the youngest, the youngest kid, kids, the I, seven year old. I read that. Okay. But she said she would have taken them all. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a, a 17 year old girl mm -hmm. who was not present in the home and I'm, I'm, I haven't been able to find out what she's at. I'm trying to get my hand on as much of this as I can to see if there's anything that I can do personally. Uh, my concern is these children are in for a long fight in their life just to recover. First and foremost, the Kaiser study on ACEs, mm -hmm. Adverse Childhood Experiences, mm -hmm. uh, tells us that if you experience anywhere from three to four uh, adverse childhood experiences, which are anything like uh, a parent who ha has an addiction, uh, separation from your parents, other dysfunctions like abuse, whether it's neglect, uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, a uh, parent or sibling that goes to prison. All of these things are adverse childhood experiences. Sexual abuse, uh, all these are adverse childhood experiences. You get four of those and life is going to be extremely difficult, even in your health outcomes, long after you stop experiencing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for instance, mm. uh, a kid with four uh, ACEs is 12 times more likely to uh, attempt suicide than a kid with none. Wow. So and you say four. What do you mean four? Like they've had four different every, if, if, if your parent, situations. If your parent is an alcoholic, that's an ace. That's okay. one point. Every 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 <coughs> occurrence is one point. Oh, so wow. if you have a, a parent who's an alcoholic and hits you, that's two. And so it goes, each one of those things, a parent that goes to prison, that's three. And so now you're in that place where it's going to have an, a, a lifelong impact, even after therapy. These impacts a higher rate of heart disease, a higher rate of diabetes. All these things can be traced in ACEs. So you got that part of it, but you got to deal with the trauma. If they don't find someone who is capable of helping them integrate these, the, these integrate traumas. these tra traumatic memories <coughs> to where they become a moment in time and not relived realities, then they're going to be suffering and struggling and probably going to deal with addiction and a bunch of other things over the course of their life. Wow. So, hey, you guys, this is um, Monica Strange uh, from Recapture Radio. Thank you so much for listening in with us today. I have Dr. Rick Wallace here in the studio, and we are talking about a local news story. It's a really a sad situation in which um, I think three children were in the home together and which one who was eight years old at the time uh, had been abandoned in an apartment locally here in Houston with, I think, a 15-year-old and then another sibling. And unfortunately, um, the eight or nine-year-old had um, died by homicide about a year ago. And these children had lived in this apartment, abandoned alone for about one year. And most recently, the 15-year-old reached out for help, I think with CPS or maybe even the police. And so we're just talking about this local news story. Um, there's so many uh, dynamics to this conversation. I did see a cousin being interviewed on uh, KPRC, her story was that they weren't engaged with the mom at all, that she would only be engaged with them when she turned up to ask for money. Mm -hmm. And then when they would go to her residence, she would say, well, I'll meet you in the front. So they would be going to see them at the apartment, but she would not let them come to her apartment. She would just meet them at the front of the apartment community they give her the money or whatever they were going to engage her with, but they had never been in the apartment unit, so they had not seen the children themselves for a ye at least a year, and so they weren't aware of all what was going on, and so we're just talking a little bit about that story and the uh, impact of this level of trauma, and as Dr. Wallace is talking to about uh, ACEs, which is Adverse Childhood Experiences, and uh, why, why would we want to have this conversation this morning? Uh, just so you can know what's happening in the community and uh, where your heart should be set for prayer. Are you praying for this community? I really believe in praying for Texas. I just feel like we have a lot of stuff that's going on. I believe in regional spirits and regional things that attack in the area. I know about a year and a half ago, I reached out to a, a pastor online because she believed in the uh, area of spiritual warfare. And about a year ago, I was just like, hey, it's a whole lot going on with these missing kids. And I just feel like there's a lot going on. What can we do? And she said to me, if God put it on your heart, it's your work. 
wait a minute, lady, you the prophet. <laughs> uh, can you help? So I do believe that there could be some regional things that we're dealing with here in Houston. We have a whole lot going on in the political spectrum. Uh, we have a whole lot going on in terms of this particular case with these children. And this is not probably isolated. So there are so many systems involved, the CPS system, the educational system with the school district. Did anybody say, hey, these kids ain't been to school in a year? Or did they just say, well, it's COVID, and so they're probably just at home. You know, so many missing things here in terms of system, um, the school system, CPS system, family systems, not blaming anybody or anything. But there's a lot of opportunities for help and support. So Dr. Wallace, continue on with your feedback. I mean, uh, in essence, I think that you covered, I think uh, the point that I would make is that there has to be community, whether we're talking uh, faith-based or we're talking from a perspective of community as blacks, we're talking from a perspective of community as uh, believers, we're talking from a perspective of community as humans. Mm -hmm. There has to be a concern for where we're at right now. I call it a state of antinomianism. It's a place where everybody's doing what they want. Antinomianism. Do. Antinomianism is a state of untethered social behavior where there are no codes, mm -hmm. no policies, no no rules of, of engagement. Everybody is doing what they want to do and defending it. And then you have other people defending it. Mm -hmm. There's so much uh, behavior that is counterproductive to social growth uh, in, in many ways. And we're birthing our children into an environment that is set to explode because it's not des the, we're not designed to operate that way. We don't, we don't work well when everybody's on their own page because things, uh, because you can actually see it with COVID mm -hmm. because con what was once congruent systems have been disrupted because everybody's not at work. Everybody's right. not in. You, you can't get uh, through uh, customer service. You go in the store, you may wait. Where it used to be somebody in your face, as moment you walk in, now you're sitting there and you're going. And, and, <laughs> and, and it's because the system has been disrupted and everybody is focused on them. And so that's what I'll see when I see these kids is nobody was looking out for them. Everybody's thinking about what little enclave of reality they're living in. Wow. So uh, we have Dr. Rick Wallace in the studio with us today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Recapture, such a heartbreaking story here in Houston regarding uh, this uh, family of children who were abandoned in their home. But the one thing about it is, is that we're just uh, sharing that information so that we could talk about uh, a sense of community. Are you available in your church and are you available within your own family? And if you're an educator, if you work in counseling or in the CPS system, are you watching and are you aware of what's happening in the community and are connected as a Christian, as you're connected as a mom, connected as a dad to see what is going on around you and so we just wanted to share that so if you pray for those children if you pray for that family uh, those workers who are dealing with that situation if you pray for them um, one of the officers who went there said it was the most egregious thing he had ever come upon mm -hmm. so we pray for those first responders uh, the extended family those children that God will heal them and uh, make them whole so thank you so much for listening to Recapture on today. I am Monica Day, Monica Strange, and this is our tip for the journey. Uh, love your neighbor as you right. love yourself. I'm Monica Strange, and have a great day. Wish a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage, uh, initiative and restoring ghetto for ghettos forgotten daughters which is a program focused on helping young girls but boys as well suffering from childhood sexual abuse uh rape molestation domestic abuse uh absentee fatherhood and so many other things uh the information will be in the box thank you